Pomeroy from Pomeroy Pacific, CEO. Mark, thanks so much for joining us this morning. The business started, I think, around four or five decades ago. Yep. Before we get into the business itself, though, tell us about your childhood growing up here in Melbourne. Family's all pretty normal. Got one sister and then um, at around the age of 10, had a tough kind of beginning, I guess, to life. My mum died from breast cancer, which was you know, obviously very difficult, but what, what it has done and, you know, that was a defining moment for me and really probably framed who I am today. It made me very independent, you know, I had a dad that as a result, you know, had to be a single dad, couldn't be around that much with work. Really has allowed me to grow on the back of that, um, you know, very, very independent and just someone that's always got things done, but it was a... Yeah, it was, a, it was a tough kind of start, but it was, I had a great childhood and, you know, amazing memories. And growing up around property, obviously there was a lot of discussion around the, the family table about property and, and business. Tell us about some of those discussions and, and how they shaped you later in life. You'd be surprised there wasn't as much, you know, when I reflect back, I never felt like, um, I was, never felt like I was being groomed into the family business. It never felt like, you know, Mark, one day I'm expecting, I never got that, I remember, some drives after dad take, you know, would take me to the footy and we'd go check on one of his sites or some projects. But it wasn't like, I want you to see this. It was more, oh, let's go for a drive and we'll check out one of these, um, these sites. So I never felt um, kind of any pressure or it wasn't a discussion at the table. Yeah, it was just always a very normal kind of upbringing. Uh, dinners, I think, as I said, you know, he was, he was there some nights, not there others. Um, but it wasn't a property driven upbringing, that's for sure. And you did your schooling in, in Melbourne, I think also went to university in Melbourne. Yeah. Tell us about Mark Pomeroy as a student, what were your favourite subjects? When I um, started, oh, I guess, normal school, it was, it was very funny. I, I don't feel like I was the best student when I was younger. And I guess on reflection that might have been just with everything going on when I was, was, was kind of 10, 11, 12. When I was 13, I got my first laptop. And that somehow completely changed me as a student. Um, and it gave me, I don't know whether it was the tools or an outlet to really focus. And I ended up really enjoying school, had a great friendship group. Um, I was very independent with getting things done. And then, you know, that progressed into um, university and you know, I went well at school, was able to go into law, uh, and even the decision of why did I go into law, I guess, was I had the marks, and I thought to myself, I have no idea what I want to do with my, <laughs> with my life, uh, and I just thought this would be a degree that, can, it, can I go wrong, kind of thing, and, and yeah, that was kind of the student of Mark. You said you went to Monash University to do a, a Bachelor of Laws. What did you learn there during that time? I often, a lot of people ask me, you know, was law a good degree given what I've been doing for the last 15 years in, in property? Law taught me how to think. And I know that's very, you know, an interesting statement, but it really taught me to have a very critical assessment of matters. You know, unlike a lot of subjects where it's, you know, uh, one plus one equals two scientific or, you know, economics of supply and demand, law is all about looking at a set of facts, understanding the risk, understanding the opportunity, understanding interpretation, um, working out ways to say different things or the same thing in a different way, um, and looking at a set of facts and how do you frame an argument to support a conclusion. So, you know, I ended up doing a straight law degree, which was five years um, of, I'd hate to think, maybe 30 legal subjects. Um, so from every aspect of thinking when it comes to law, and it really was and has been the best grounding for property, because I think a lot of what we do in property can be learnt with the right mentors, experience, you know, the, the concepts and property related matters can be learned. How to think is much harder to learn. Yeah. How to analyze things and see things from a perspective that not everybody else can see. And that leads to strategy. So when I reflect on that degree, I mean, I, 
I'm so grateful that I got to do that degree and did it because I do not think we as a company and me as an individual could have achieved and continue to kind of achieve and assess matters the way that I do. And you finished the degree in 2004 and went straight into the family business. What was your role there when you did finally come into the, into the business for the first time? Yeah, well, I actually didn't go straight into the business. I went and worked at KPMG in their tax legal department after I finished. So I finished the degree. I then went and got my articles. Then I went and joined KPMG, did around a year and a bit at KPMG, and then I joined the family business after that. And again, another doing that, even though it was only a year, not going straight into the family business was a fantastic thing to do because it really, even though short-lived, it allowed me to understand the difference between businesses. So, you know, when you can always look back and reflect on you as younger and how little you knew, even though we all thought we knew everything when we were 23, 24. That time at KPMG, I saw some great things about being in a big business, but I also saw a lot of things that I wanted to make sure was, were not replicated in a business if I could ever influence my own business. Um, so I worked there, then joined um, the family business and I started as an assistant development manager. And when I say I knew nothing about property, really, I knew nothing. You know, I mean, you think you know everything because you think you've grown up with a dad that, so you must know it, but I didn't. But that's where I, I started and then I've just, you know, progressed over the last 15 years uh, through the business. And that assistant development uh, manager role in, in that first year, what, what were some of the hurdles or, or biggest learnings that you learned during that first year that, that sort of, you know, you took to your career later in life as well? I started on a project called Warika, which was one of our own family developments, which was seven large showrooms on Princess Highway in Clayton. It had another, oh, I can't remember, 25 office warehouses at the rear, it was about a $40 million project. Um, and pretty much I was just doing the, all the, the, the bits and stuff that you know, just needed to get done, following up agents, um, going to site walks. But I think really the first few years, it's actually about the relationship I had with my dad and the way in which he allowed me to grow. And if, if I can, maybe I'll just share a bit about that because I think that is kind of the key learnings that I'm gonna, um, that I did take out of that. And what it was, he didn't just say, you're an assistant development manager, manager, you do your role. He basically took me and invited me to every single meeting, event, anything that he had, I went to. So meetings that no assistant development manager would usually go to, whether it be with banks, with clients, I was at and I sat there and I did this for three years and all I did was took notes. People would think I was taking notes to write minutes. I was not taking notes about the meeting. I was writing every single bit of information that I didn't understand. That, you know, the word LVR, LCR, gearing, um, strategy, why would we be selling it for this? Why are we not discount? Why are we doing, and just writing questions and every day 4.30 I'd go into his office and we'd spend anywhere from half an hour to an hour and a half going through those questions and he would explain to me the why. Not the what but why. Why he was in a meeting saying this, why he didn't say that, why he's then drafted the letter, what's the outcome he's trying to achieve. That learning is what set me up. Not not the learning of being an assistant development manager, not doing the task. I'd be 10 years away from where I am today had I not had him as a mentor really taking the time, not just to tell me what to do, which unfortunately happens in so many businesses from leaders, but taking the time to tell me why we're doing it. And that is something that has stayed with me and is what I try and instill and work with our team today, is always understand the why. If you're doing something and you do not understand the why, stop. Find someone, ask the why. And I think that is, above all the lessons and messages I can ever think, 
It's the, it addresses opportunity, it addresses risk, right? And it addresses growth, you know? And it's the simplest way to grow quickly. And too many people across a whole industry generally just do, but not understanding why. And he set up the business 50 years ago today. What else do you think has been the key to the longevity of the, of the business over those 50 years? It's passion. You, know, you can't st survive anything for long unless you truly love and are passionate about what you do and believe, believe in it. And he has expressed, and to even still today, this concept of passion Passion is, you know, the love of doing something, but not just doing something, it's actually knowing what you're doing, standing for something. And I think as a business, and certainly he started this, this concept of standing for quality, doing things better, not just following the guy that did it yesterday, but how do we do something better? How do we add more value? How do we look at the status quo and not just accept it, it might still be the best way, but how do we challenge it? Even when you know our family business started in industrial, oh, well, didn't start there, but we did a lot of industrial in the 70s, 80s. He was the first developer in industrial to put a toilet inside, like a plumbed toilet in industrial. And he would tell the story that when he did that, people thought he was crazy because he had to lease it for something like 10 or um, $15 more a meter, right? Or back then, <laughs> 150 bucks a foot or whatever it was. And everyone was saying, you're nuts. And a big American company came and said, well, I'll pay anything because all the other industrial have got the cans, you know, sitting out the front. Yeah. And that gave him a huge head start because he was the first one to do that. He was innovative. Um, landscaping, we were one of the first industrial developers to put a landscape strip in industrial. Today, I mean, duh, of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. But back then, you know, so, and then he did um, 553 St Kilda Road, you know, with a palm tree in the middle of the, of the lobby, we did 580 St Kilda Road, which had a tennis court on the rooftop um, of an office building. Innovative, you know, a curved roof um, on 580 St Kilda Road, and still it stands out today from Albert Park as a beautiful building. And do you think there's still room um, for that sort of innovation today to do some of those sort of things, or do you think you sort of have to follow the, the rules and regulations more today and, and everything sort of looks the same? There's not much flexibility in the design. It's a, it's a great question, and I think that is a, a fundamental problem with the planning scheme at the moment, and one that I wish I had an easy answer and said, if I was minister, this is what I would do. Um, but. You know, I personally do not like the idea of rigidity because I think design excellence should dictate um, planning outcomes to some extent. There, there needs to be some guides, but once you start to talk anything that is mandatory, you are creating a box, right? Even if you can mandate other elements, you are going to dictate an outcome that anybody that's looking at it in a competitive environment is about how do I maximize the yield within the defined boundaries? And sometimes, you know, height should not be the enemy. Um, it's about the outcome that you can achieve. And sometimes, you know, we, we see it all the time with buildings that go up and whether they're in your own street, somebody else's street, people that object. Often when they're built, if the build form is good, it, it, it's, it's immaterial. It's the fear that people have um, and so, yeah, so if it was up to me, I would, I think design excellence needs to uh, rule the roost to some extent. And I think though there is always chance for innovation. Innovation, and not just innovation, but quality. Doing things well. Planning projects that truly meet the demand. And remember, demand is not always known. Um, if, if Steve Jobs waited for the demand for the Apple iPod, we'd have no iPod. Right, he, he saw, the, he believed the market would want this. And he created a demand. Uh, very hard in what we do, but that is what a great developer, and it's not easy, and 
but that is, if you can aspire to something, it's to how do you design buildings, how do you design amenity, opportunity, something about that building that someone goes, wow, I didn't realise I want this, or even better, I didn't realise I need this. And that's the way of thinking that I believe great developers should aspire to and it's just how far you can push that because the risk is if you go too far, um, you will build a monument of your own stupidity. <laughs> Talk to us about the, the business itself. What is the offering of Pomeroy Pacific and, and who are your clients that you offer those services to? As you, you said, we're 50 years. So in that history, there's been a lot of different business units, lots of different offerings. But today, the business is made up of three core business units um, and then a separate business uh, on the side, which we'll talk about as well. But we have a project management, development management. So call that the development advisory side to the business. And that business um, helps developers, high net worth individuals, corporates, to deliver their development projects. And when I use the word deliver, it really is, depending on the client, it can be as early as point of um, acquisition or pre-acquisition. So Pomeroy, should I buy this site? Or Pomeroy, I've got money, but I don't have the internal expertise. Can we work together, find a, find a site, and you basically assume the position as developer for me and manage my interests through to completion. And depending who our client is will depend where in the cycle they may get us involved. So we do a lot of work for GPT on a number of shopping centres, they have internal development managers, so our focus generally with them is more the project management side. How do we make sure that all the regulatory service related issues on existing shopping centres can be managed so we can do an extension to a centre or a renovation to the centre um, and then ultimately manage the negotiation of a construction contract and manage the building through to completion. We did the East Burwood Shopping Centre, um, which is a massive shopping centre, um, neighbourhood shopping centre, and that client, we ran everything with them, as in for them. And then we have private developers who just get us in at different points in time, and then there's a number of clients who just want us to work together with them to manage their project. And in that space, why Pomeroy? And I guess that's kind of what is it that we do differently? We really understand the development equation. And it sounds very simple when I say that, but a lot of project managers really understand and focus on cost. And I'm the first to say, you have gotta manage cost. But a project is not just about managing cost. It's actually about managing profit. And how do you manage profit? You manage cost, you mitigate risk, but you also understand revenue. And if you don't have a true holistic understanding, and unfortunately not all companies do understand the holistic nature, you make bad decisions. And in our game, bad decisions don't cost five or 10 grand, they can cost millions. So to be around 50 years, you only can survive that long offering a service-based offering with repeat clients, right? And how do you get repeat clients? You do a good job, right? And you add value, you manage risk, and they are really what it's about. So when I think about what do we do, we add value to projects and we manage risk. We understand how to foresee it. We've been there, we've been around a long time. We've seen how things can go wrong and we preempt it. And it doesn't mean we don't have issues. Everyone does, every project does. Anyone that says their project was perfect, I know they're, they're bullshitting me, all right? Because it doesn't exist. But it's how you manage it and how you ride through it. So that's the development, the delivery arm. Then we've got the development arm to the business where the Pomeroy family will essentially work with Pomeroy Pacific, all kind of one in the same, but to deliver our own projects. So at the moment, we've got our next project, which is in Cranbourne. It's gonna be 170 townhouses, very much aimed at the affordable end of the market. You're talking 399 to 460,000 for townhouses in Cranbourne West. Um, and we're hoping to start that project in July of this year. So that's a project where you know, we've acquired the site, 
um, and we still partner generally with investors, uh, but we'll deliver that project and that'll be a Pomeroy um, development, all right? So, and we actually believe and see and have learned over the years that having the advisory arm and the development arm adds significant value to the advisory arm because what it means, we don't have a team that delivers our own pro projects and a different team that work. It's one and the same team, but it means that the team actually understands the real pressures of a developer. Because when I need to come in, my pressures, my stresses are no different to the stresses that my clients might have on their own project. And so my own team needs to see me, yes, as their, um, I guess, boss leader in respect to the delivering project, but also as their client when, we, when we're doing our own projects. So we've got a very diverse skill set and ability to understand and manage projects because we sit across the full spectrum. Then we've got the capital advisory arm to the business. Um, so that's a business we call Pomeroy Capital, and that's been established around two years ago. We're nearing half a billion dollars now in um, debt um, for clients. And that doesn't mean they have to be a Pomeroy Pacific client. It's just people that have the need for debt solutions. And the offering of that business is very simple. Uh, we believe and we're very confident, having done what I think is quite a significant amount of debt in only two years, uh, we believe that if you bring us a job, a, a, pro a problem, probably better than a job, if you bring us a problem that requires debt or a project that requires debt, we believe we will find you the most cost competitive um, debt solution in the marketplace because we've got over 30 funders and we only deal with sophisticated, well-known, respectable funders, but not just in Melbourne, the whole of Australia and international funders. And we know who is looking for what type of debt products so we can match them as opposed to a lot of people might have an existing relationship with one or two. It doesn't mean they are necessarily right, they might be, for that deal. And our proposition in that business is very simple. If we don't get you the best deal, no problem. Do it with anyone you want, right? So we'll back ourselves, right? You give, give us the problem, we'll find the solution. And so that business has grown beautifully over the last couple of years. And I believe moving forward, given the environment we're in, and I think my personal views on what's gonna happen with debt moving forward, I think it's going to continue to be a very strong aspect um, to the Pomeroy offering. And underpinning each of those three business units you mentioned is, is team. How do you build a great culture within the team? Culture's a key, <laughs> always key in every business and it's something that that one year at KPMG taught me a lot about culture. Um, and it really allowed me to understand what culture means and the idea behind it and the the idea of saying, doing. And so firstly, culture, you can put any word you want on a whiteboard, you can put anything on walls. If the leaders of the business do not represent the culture, there is no culture. The culture is whatever the leaders of the business represent. That's, I really believe that. Because generally, if you can develop culture right, it permeates through the team from top down, right? And that goes to then the way that you recruit, the way in which you coach, the way in which you mentor, and that needs to flow all the way down. And so culture requires for me the discipline to get rid of the wrong people in your business. That's number one. And that has been a lesson that has been painful over many years and one that today I'm much better at because I, you know, it, it's so true, it's we all hold on to people, the wrong people too long in business. And I do not know a business leader owner that has been around with staff that doesn't say that they've held on to the wrong people for too long. So I think having the discipline to know who's right and who lives and will share and breathe the way, uh, the culture that you want to project through the business, that's key. So the right people, number one, and then 
you know, it's good to have all those catchwords and all that, but really the way we live it, we just lead by example. You know, we live and lead by example, and I truly think that as a business, we're a great place to work. We've got a very high performance energy. It is a high performance team. So, you know, if you're looking for the cushy job, it's probably not the right place here, but we're very respectful, very respectful of everybody. We are clear on the expectations, right? And we have a good time. We do lots of social events, um, but there is an expectation that, you know, you do what you say, um, you say what you mean, and it's a no excuse mentality. So, you know, if you're, if you're a doer and you get things done, and you've got a nice, friendly, fun personality, that's our culture. But if you're, it's always somebody else's kind of fault, that's everything we are not as a culture because that does not fit into the concept of high performance. And moving to the market today, you joined the business in 2005, so you obviously went through the GFC. How challenging has the last two to three months been for you in the business as compared with other downturns in economic cycles? The last three months has been the hardest, the hardest time for us, certainly in my 15, 16 years that I, I can remember. And not so much from a business point of view per se or from a financial point of view, but from a staff leadership point of view. Um, you know, as a business, we understand that what's going on right now hasn't necessarily impacted our business and the market directly as at today, but we know what is likely to be coming. Um, we know the pain across all the um, property, I guess different consultancies, the number of people that have lost jobs, salary reductions, um, lots of people being asked to work three day weeks or four day weeks, um, and we are no different. So whilst, you know, business at this point is very, very good. And you know, no matter what happens, the market can't kill us. We're very well positioned. We've ridden through enough difficult times through our history that we'll, we'll ride through this. But you know, when you've got a team that you value and you want to maintain, and you've got first you know, 40 odd people remote, uh, working from home, not being able to support them in the same type of ways, um, and you know there's pressures everyone's got different pressures so it's been very challenging emotionally um, as a leader of a business and knowing that ultimately you know it's my job to make sure that on the back of this everyone still has their job that we are perfectly positioned to grow um, but that we don't put our head in the sand and just think she'll be right that's you know to, to think and to take that burden on you know, it, it is difficult, but as I said, we're not one with excuses or complaints, so it is what it is. You can't change yesterday, you can influence tomorrow, and that's always my focus, you know. So whatever happens in business, in life, you can't change it. We can learn from it, and we can influence tomorrow. And that's, you know, my role now is to make sure that we continue to grow, win more work, find new opportunities, and come out of this stronger than we were going into it. And what opportunities or challenges do you see in the Melbourne market at the moment? You mentioned there that you're doing a large townhouse project in Cranbourne. What was the opportunity that you saw there? Obviously that was several years ago and, and what opportunity do you see today? Yeah, I mean, so th this was a recent purchase of, when I say recent, November last year. Um, it's that product, we're right at the affordable end of the market. So clearly when I bought it, I didn't know COVID was, you know, around the corner. Um, but had I had the opportunity to buy that site today with COVID, I would still buy that site. I think the bottom end of the market, um, and when I say the bottom end, the affordable end of the market, if you can have product that is at or below the median house price, within um, you know, suburban areas, I think you're gonna stay very strong because buyers, buyers live in a pyramid, right? You know, you've got how many people can afford a $10 million apartment? Very small, you know, and then you work your way down and even the people that could afford, say, a $700,000 apartment or maybe townhouse, all of a sudden, they're now saying, shit, 
Maybe I can't afford 700. Maybe I don't want to expose myself to the additional debt. What can I buy for 500? Someone looking in Cranbourne that might have had a budget of 550 for a house and land says, I can buy a three bedroom, two car townhouse for 450. Do I, you know, so I, I actually think you're going to just get more people getting pushed down the pyramid, which will create opportunity. I'm nervous about that mid market though, because I think that's the market that is more likely to be hit. If you're selling product at that 850,000 mark, I, I just think a lot of people aren't going to move and make decisions for the next year or so. So I think that's going to be a lot of the slowdown in demand putting the fact that we've got immigration challenges and other um, issues there that I can talk to if you wish. But yeah, I think residential, the downsizer market will be there, but the challenge there is how does a downsizer market usually work? They sell their existing home for a number, they're in a stable market, they know that they're buying something that's not gonna be built for two years but they kind of know that chances are that their house is worth X today, it'll still be worth X tomorrow or X plus a number in two years time. Okay, I'll sell that, I'll end up with a million in my pocket or two million and I'll go into an apartment. If you live in a home today, do you want to put it on the market? Do you know where your house is going to be in 18 months? There's too much uncertainty. So until there gets stability in the market, I just think a lot of the owner occupiers are going to sit. And what that then, the flow through, if you work through what, the, what does that mean, there'll be a number of sites that need pre-sales that may not get their pre-sales. The benefit is debt is cheap, but a lot of the sites that have been land banked or been bought with a 12 month or 18 month debt facility have actually used private debt and the private debt sitting at anywhere maybe a year ago from 8 to 10% or 11%, uh, that does start to eat its head off. People that have got bank debt, you know, the cost of sitting is, other than the land tax, which is material, but other than land tax, the debt is pretty low. But I think there are gonna be some developers who are gonna do it tough that aren't gonna get the downsize of sales, right? And they're gonna be looking for ways to get their projects funded without pre-sales, which will again be difficult. Uh, not impossible, but very challenging. So, you know, I, I, the way I look at everything is about risk. So I'm always looking at opportunity, but it's really, what are my exits? What does it mean if this and this happens? Okay, and if that happens, what am I play here? What's it gonna cost me if I need to sit here? How do we do that? And I just don't think over the last few years, there are lots of people that don't do that. And that's the experience of being around long enough and learning some great sayings from my dad, such as, you know, the market can make it and the market can take it. And for many, many years, people have never seen how the market can take it, All right? And it's very easy to make money when the market makes it for you. We are in a very different world now where there will be opportunity. There is always opportunity. It doesn't matter if a market's good, shit, it doesn't matter, there's opportunity. So long as you can manage the risk and understand it. And that's where, you know, I don't believe there's gonna be this widespread market collapse, but there will be um, pain and there will be projects that won't be able to get off the ground but then it goes to, but are they not getting off the ground because they were never great projects? And are you bullish or bearish on any particular sectors? I mean, are you sort of bullish on, on where industrial is at at the moment and, and not so much on commercial? Shed some light on, on where you see opportunity in particular sectors. Yeah, I wouldn't say I am bullish on anything, <laughs> um, but office, office would certainly be a concern. Um, why is it a concern is there has been a lot of supply, a lot of supply coming and a lot of backfill space, certainly CBD, that is going to have to be filled. Um, so I'm nervous over the next two years about what's going to happen with incentives and rentals on office and there's going to be a number, there are lots of sites that people 
had a site, they've owned it for maybe three years. Originally they were gonna do residential. Residential got too hard, I'm gonna do a hotel. Hotel got too hard, I'm gonna do an office. And now that merry-go-round has kind of stopped, what do you do with the site? So office, you know, again, there'll be opportunities if you can buy right, there'll be opportunity and at some point that backfill will be filled. We're still much more competitive than Sydney by way of rates, so there's room there, but if there is oversupply, um, it's something has to give. So office I'm nervous about, um, but I think suburban office could really benefit on the back of COVID. Because if I'm a business and I've got 300 staff, 200 staff, even 100 staff, and I'm over four floors in the CBD paying 850 bucks a meter, and 80% of that staff that's in there, they're not attending boardroom meetings, they're not attending, they don't have visitors that they're having meetings with that need to come into a beautiful reception. Why do they need to be in the CBD? Why not pay $320 a meter, right? And be out in the suburbs and have new types. I just think you're gonna see a lot of businesses as their rents or their um, term expires that are gonna be thinking about, is there a more cost-effective way to run our operation? Do we really need everyone in one place? And that could be a further pull of people out of the CBD and even from areas like your South Yarra, Cremorne. I mean, South Yarra, there's very limited supply, but Cremorne, uh, it's staggering the number of permits that you know exist and the number of people that have bought things. So just rounding out that question, industrial, look, I'm still very, I guess I'm on the bullish side of industrial. I think that's gonna benefit from this uh, or from COVID. Uh, it's, we've seen a huge push as we know in people into um, online sales and the, that whole logistics market is just gonna grow. So, but like everything, it's about the right and wrong sites. I, I always struggle when people talk about broad sectors. You know, they, the residential market. Well, you gotta break it down. There's the investment market product, there's the owner occupier, there's high density, there's, you know, medium density there. And then there's suburbs and all these different, there's townhouse versus, you've really got to get into each single one. And if the site's right and the opportunity's right, you can still make money if you buy right on any site, because all the money's in the buying. Mark, what's the lending environment like at the moment? I know the banks say they're open for business and they might be, but I think what we're finding at the moment, my experience is banks have really, they've really retreated firstly in any land acquisitions. So people that are buying the development site and need to settle, getting support from your banks, whilst yes, they will all tell you that they're doing deals, relative to the number of people that are buying and needing to settle, I would suggest that a lot of them, a large majority of developers or purchasers who have bought sites with an intent to develop will not be able to get bank funding, okay? And certainly not within the time frames that they thought and or at the gearing that they might have expected, okay? So that has seen a really strong push into the private debt market and I believe that's here to stay. I think, whilst no one has officially said it, I don't think the banks have any intention coming back into the land space. And when I say land, I'm not talking greenfield only, I'm talking any kind of non-income or low income producing block that somebody buys with an intent to develop. So the space step one for private funding in respect to acquisitions, I think is a growing sector and is gonna be the, the major way most people require um, or will will settle sites using private debt. Private debt on land, it is a significantly more expensive way though than, um, than the banks. The banks, 3%, you know, half a percent app fee, not even. Um, private money will be anywhere from an application fee of one to one and a half percent. 
and then, and sometimes more depending on the complexity of the deal and the gearing levels, and then interest rates anywhere from 10% to 12% and depending on level of gearing, whether the interest is prepaid in advance, the facility might be fully drawn. So, you know, there's, there's lots of subtleties and they're not tricks. So when I say subtleties, it's just funders have worked out ways in which they borrow the capital and it changes the way in which they'll then lend it in the terms. Um, so there really is though quite a material difference with those funders in land and the type of project. So as I alluded to earlier, really matching size of um, debt required, type of project, likelihood of development of that project, and a range of other issues will dictate what is what and who is the right type of funder for these land projects. And when I say land, land settlement. Then in the, then in the construction side, um, I think the big difference is gonna be in gearing and pre-sales. Pre-sales remain difficult, okay? Um, and as long as pre-sales remain difficult, developers still need their projects to go ahead. How are these projects gonna go ahead is through debt solutions that are much more flexible, that allow maybe a 70 or a 60% debt cover by way of pre-sales. Uh, senior banks typically 110% um, you know, pre-sales, remove your GST, so there's your 100% debt cover. That's taking a long time. Yeah? So then you've got modelling now. So the way when our clients and even ourselves, when we're buying sites now, I'm modelling my entire purchase on the basis of private money. Right? I hope I can get a senior bank solution, but I'm now buying on private money. That's a material difference in what you can afford to pay for the land. But I think it's here to stay. And I think the challenges working with the banks at the, unless they change some of their processes is gonna remain difficult. And what's good about privates, and I guess where we work, we understand property. Bankers are bankers, they're bankers. And it's not a criticism. It's like an architect's an architect. An architect's not a project manager. They didn't become an architect because they wanted to manage projects. They became an architect because they had a passion, a desire to create, to draw, to express. Yeah. Yet somehow some roles then morph. And you know, there are some bankers that are very good in property, but a lot aren't. And the whole structure of a bank is not designed to understand and facilitate solutions. It's become process. Developments are complex. The issues, the makeup, the structure, it requires structured solutions and we're private, the good private debt offerings. And what we work with our clients is how do we package and resolve the issues in a way that allows projects to be funded and to get them off the ground. That to me, and that is the future. I have no doubt the complexities are gonna continue, the challenges are gonna continue, and you're gonna to have to be sophisticated smart to find ways to get these projects funded. And that's where I believe a company like the Pomeroy Capital Business, that's what we'll do, because we understand property, we understand the issues, we understand the model, the fees, the cash flows, um, and we work out ways to present it to a funder to get to yes. Because once, once you present it, you only have one chance. And one to finish, what is the future of the Pomeroy Pacific business? I mean, obviously you've got Pomeroy Capital and then the development and investment management arms yeah. as well. Tell us about where you see the future of the business as a whole. So I think first as a commitment and a vision for our business, we are crystal clear on growing each, each sector. So I strongly believe the need for sophisticated management of projects will remain and I think it's gonna grow. I still believe companies are seeing the benefits of utilizing experienced outsourced management, whether it be development management, project management, advisory, or all three, as opposed to employing people in. I think a lot of the smarter developers will employ one person experience to oversee someone like us, I get that, right? And a lot that want to remain nimble will just employ a company like us. And 
you know, the problem with one person, one person can never know everything. They can't, they can't be an expert with everything. But when you work with groups like us that are diverse and have, you know, ex-builders, tier one builders, tier two builders, civil engineers, trained project managers, ex-architects, um, ex-planners, and you get this full gamut of expertise, and then you layer onto that the likes of a Doug Pomeroy, Talis Stearns, our COO, ex-Crown, understanding of hotel, hotels, hospitalities, Spencer Lowry's from a um, development point of view, understanding aged care, you know, all these areas. Why, if you're a developer, you try and get one guy to fit all these roles, where once the rapport's right and the trust is built, and trust doesn't happen overnight, right? But once it's built, the depth of experience, whether it be capital raising, it's just, that's the value. And I just believe as companies, I think will be more cost conscious about overheads, about do I need another seat in my office, right? That I think quality service will continue to rise to the top. And when times get tough, quality always rises, always. Because suddenly you're not in a market that makes it for you. You actually have to make it yourself. And you don't make it yourself if you surround yourselves with number twos. You need the best people around you. So I, I've got a huge amount of confidence in that management side. Um, and we're gonna continue to invest in getting the best and brightest people that can grow that business. Then the uh, capital, as I said, I just think that is, I think helping clients, not just existing, but people to solve funding solutions and package their projects in a manner that allows us to find them the cheapest cost to capital. I think, you know, there's lots of brokers out there that just present, they don't know what they're doing. They don't, they can't look at the feasibility and critically assess, they can't sit with the developer and talk about the market, talk about how do we pivot here, how do we do this, what's our answer if this happens and solve the solutions and then actually talk in their language. That is what we do. We can speak to the funders and we understand how to convey the information and share risk, but also the flip side, how are we dealing with that risk, the mitigation strategies. And that, you know, and that's why we're not a broker, we're a facilitator or an arranger, right? We solve the problems, it's solution driven. So, you know, I, I'm really committed to, to that side of the business as well and the development. I'm, I just think difficult times, things get tough, that's opportunity. If you're smart, you make money, it's much easier to make money in a bad market than a good market. In a good market, we struggle in development. We really do struggle because there's always someone who thinks that they can build cheaper right, and sell for more. And that means it's very hard to buy a site unless you're willing to follow the masses. And that's all fine until the merry-go-round stops and you get stuck. So when things get tough and more challenging and the risk assessment process is no longer just about cost and revenue, it's finance and the market more broadly and really you know, finding investors for pro The challenges for developers are much more heightened now than they've ever been. For a company like us, I kind of lick my lips because I know that we are positioned to find ways to buy sites, find value, and we know then how to manage the downside. Mark, an incredible journey and uh, an extremely exciting future ahead. Thanks so much for your time.